Do feel free to jump in with questions as I go because it does make it more interesting and I'm quite happy to be challenged and you should feel challenged. When I look at those acronyms up there that um, somehow describe what's going on in the world today, um, it's very challenging for us at the chalk face but I think also for you people who are slightly distant there's um, some interesting work we have to do to make things just a little bit better for our our people. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today because I'm excited about talking with professionals who are interested in the reality rather than the rumours, rather than the emotive language and some of the really ineffective and unhelpful things that are going on at the moment out there um, that are really causing us not to be focused on what we should be and we hear these sorts of things being said out and about in the community and they're really not helpful. So I, I think it's quite powerful and useful for us to have a chat together and perhaps clarify some of these things, particularly as you are so influential in our young teachers coming out and working in these spaces. And what you say and what you think and your attitude has a significant impact, not only for them, but for the people they're working with, which is why I'm more than happy for you to challenge me, critique me, argue with me. I'm going to challenge you, but I'm going to tell you I had all those things at the meeting with PTA that I attended on Friday in Wellington right. from the union. All the, exactly those. And, the, and that's another thing I could put, put up there would be um, secondary think this thing and primary th think this thing. And that's a sad um, moment we're at at the moment. And part of my research, and the reason why I do what I do, and sorry, the colours are very different from what it shows in mine, but to, just to position me so you know where I'm coming from in the context of this. So um, back down the bottom here it says um, environments where children lead their learning. I have been fascinated in that for over a decade. And at um, Windsor School we created, or sorry, back at Clarkville School as a principal before Windsor, we created a thing called Chill Factor, there's another acronym for you, which is children independently leading their learning. They still use. And we were really interested in how do, we, how do we enable that to happen in our spaces and it led us on a journey that made us reconsider what a classroom would look like, what the furniture would look like, what the learning would look like in a space. And then what would that look like if you decided to break out of that space and not learn inside the 66 square metre box. That was my first jump into this and then um, I started my master's research I think three years back, a while back, I can't remember, it might have been a bit longer. Yeah, I started my, sorry, my master's study, and then I started my thesis this year. Um, and my, my work has really primarily been around collaborative teaching and the interest I have in that. And then I was fortunate enough to win the CPPA fellowship this year so I could travel internationally and, and get a bit more of an idea of what's going on globally. And as I did so, I looked into the open plan era. But even more importantly for why I'm talking about why I'm talking about is because of where I am right now. So my study could be no more relevant than it is for what, the situation I'm in. So the leader of Waitakere School and I've been leading and learning with the team as we've transitioned from two schools into one school, back out to dual sites, which we switched over twice over the two years. So we had 350, 400 children on each site in the first year. Now we've got 500, one and 200 on the other. And these sites were primarily traditional classrooms. And I have been leading and learning with these people as we've made the paradigm shift from that to collaborative teaching and learning and flexible learning spaces which has made my study so interesting because I'm... <coughs> How do you get rid of... Oh, if I turn my wireless off? Yeah, turn your wireless off. Ah, <coughs> uh, oh, it came back. Yeah, it'll, it'll do it a few times. Yeah, that's a break time in case there's any questions at that point. <laughs> So um, on the 11th of December, we get handed the keys to a new school. That school has six learning studios. Each of those has between 100 and 112 children in it. So four to six classrooms, four to six teachers. 470 square metres, a big space in the middle. Breakout learning areas down each side. Totally and utterly collaborative spaces. Flexible learning spaces. So you can see why I'm interested in doing what I'm doing. And, um, the importance for our staff and our community that we're informed as we go into this paradigm shift because one of the concerns I have is people just suddenly put in holes in walls and say let's put a hole in a wall, that's a good idea, or let's suddenly co-teach, that's a good idea and I'll get to the problem with that a bit further on. I'm going to add one that PGA also said, this is ministry driven because it's saving money on furniture. And that is a great one, that is a great one. Seriously. Um, I had the pleasure of writing to Peter Hughes a while back and I said here's my concerns about the process we're in 
and hear some of the issues I have about some of the things that are, are being communicated. And he was kind enough to invite me up there, so I spent an afternoon with him and um, another Deputy Secretary of Education. I came away from there convinced that they're actually, they're actually really interested in providing the best possible learning environments for our children. It doesn't save them a heck of a lot of money. We still got X amount of dollars per square metre. It didn't matter whether we were doing our building or 25 classrooms. So it is another little bit of rhetoric that's out there. So here's what my interest predominantly lies around. And it, mine is more around the adult interactions because of where we're at with this. So what difference does it make for adults? And as you can imagine, I, I would suggest it's a, a doctoral project and, and plenty, plenty more projects if you're starting to look at the difference for children. And while I will comment on it, because of where I'm in my situation at work, it's not where my research sits around the impact for children. Just need to be totally upfront about that. So, my work is around MLEs, ILEs, MLP, ILS, FLS, DQLS, MOE, BOT, SLT, PLT, RTC and PTCs and help me. And last term I went all over the place to find out more about that. So I, I spent most of my time in the last two years in Melbourne visiting copious schools. Melbourne because they have had a whole lot more letters. So before the GFC, they had the BEF and the BRE. In other words, they were given a whole lot of money before the global financial crisis if they could show that they had a pedagogical reason for a shift in what they were doing in this space. And the ministry would come along and say, well, that's fascinating. So you're wanting to do this in your space. You want to change your pedagogy. Here's some money to do it. So it was very well informed of changes to their spaces. And we're going back nearly 10 years. And then we would see iterations going forward as they worked in that space and said, hang on, we need to refine it a bit more and a bit more and a bit more. The problem was that the global financial crisis came along. This is important for you to know because you'll hear about Melbourne. And after the GFC, the government all across Australia said, everyone can have three million bucks or thereabouts. Now build something. And of course what they did is they saw what you did there was fantastic. We might build one of those. So they built a building and they didn't work on the pedagogy of the understandings behind it. So there are spaces in Melbourne where you will see that they have closed up doors and walls. And there are spaces in Melbourne where you'd walk and you'd think, why are you doing this? But that's history repeating itself, which we'll talk about a bit further on. So here's the criteria for my study. Two years minimum in a collaborative teaching and learning environment, a flexible learning space. And I'll differentiate those in a moment. And the other people I wanted to talk to and listen to, so I surveyed 28 teachers, 12 principals, 15 schools, interviewed another 10 of those. For my thesis work and for my fellowship work, I visited copious more schools and interviewed and talked to people. So that's where my, my thinking comes from. We're not going to talk about this today, but it is important for you to know that as we build forward, um, my research would indicate that if we want to create effective, collaborative teaching and learning environments, there are some key components that will enable those. And what I haven't shown in here, because we should all just have it as a given, is effective pedagogy should be number one. Quality teaching and learning, whatever you want to call it, that should be our primary driver. Provided we understand that, and we understand student-centred learning, these other things are critically important if we want to create the best possible learning environment for our children. Make sense? Okay. So, here's what we're going to chat about today. And the biggest question for all of us, and I'd have to say it was, was not particularly well answered by the Secretary, is why? So they, ha they haven't really nailed down the rationale well yet, and in New Zealand that's because they say, that's your job. And I'm not sure that that's quite the right approach. Maybe they need to know a little bit more about why they're encouraging schools to do what they're doing rather than just saying come up with a vision for learning in your space. So there's a little bit of a, a gap there. What I hope to do is provide you with some clarity about some of these things. I do want to challenge you, and I do want to um, hear your questions and maybe send you away with some questions to think about in the space that you work and the influence that you have with our future teachers. So why are we doing it? And the very first answer should be because it is no longer 1915. This is the last vestige of that schooling system that we should be moving away from. The traditional schooling system where I stand up the front like I am now and I disperse all my wonderful knowledge to you and you take it in and you go home and you cram it and you come back and give me something on paper tomorrow. 
It's, it should be because we understand children don't learn the way that they believed they learned in 1915. And we're about the only thing in the world that hasn't changed. <coughs> Transport, leisure time, communication, workplaces, medicine, every other place has changed so much that if you took a time traveller, and we'll go from 1950 just to be generous, and you took them out in 1950 and you dropped them into one of those environments now, they would freak right out. But would they in a lot of schools around the world? Would they just stand up and say, oh yeah, this is pretty much what I was doing in 1950, not too much needs to be changed? And is that acceptable when we're trying to prepare our children for their future? And I'd suggest it's not. So here's the three main reasons, certainly in our place, why we believe flexible learning spaces and collaborative teaching and learning environments should be occurring. And the first one is not just an educational reason. So it's beyond education, the collaboration makes a difference. Where two people work together, they tend to outperform themselves based on their past performance. Get those brains talking and things going. Um, particularly in the US, um, the, the drive is how do I really meet the needs of the children in my class and there's such a huge emphasis on accountability and standards and can I do that on my own and continue to meet all the needs of everyone in the class. And the best example I can give you is there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's 18 of you in the room. I know that already I would have lost some of you. And some of you will be thinking about other things that you're doing in other places. That's the reality of one person trying to teach a group of people. Because I will not connect with every one of you. I'll nearify stuff, and my nearified version will not work for every person in this room. But if I was here with my DP Jackie, or one of my other teachers, you'd get two versions, and we would just double the possibility that what we're hoping would be a learning outcome today might occur. And teachers really just have to get over, maybe university lecturers get over themselves a wee bit and stop pretending and believing that you can connect with every single learner in your space. Because it's just not the truth. And finally, I think most importantly, if we look at the NZC, flexible learning spaces, which is all the ministry give us, there's a better opportunity we're going to meet the needs of our learners and create the spaces we want for learning, the modes for learning in one of those than you will in one of these. That's pretty straightforward. I don't know any teacher who I've surveyed or worked with who's in one of these spaces that wants to go back to trying to cope on their own. And the comments are, I was lonely, I was isolated, and I didn't realise how hard it was to problem solve and be accountable for every child in my class when I had to do it on my own. And I think what was really telling is I visited a couple of teachers and interviewed them about this whole process. And I said, how do you feel about people coming into your classroom, particularly me? And she said, no matter what you did before, when you came into my classroom, I was worried. I was worried about you sitting talking to some of the children, what they were telling you. I was worried about what you saw in the space. She said, I don't care now. And the reason she doesn't care is because two people working together develop this bond and trust and relationship about what we're doing is the right thing. So they've had some dialogue and some discussion and some debate about whether this is quality learning. If I did go up to her and say, I'm concerned about this. She said, well, that's interesting. We had a talk about it. Here's our reasons. So as a teacher, her efficacy was improved because of the fact that she was working in a space with someone else. We should be doing it. We should be doing it because of one of three learning outcomes we're after, or three outcomes. And this is for our schools. Schools may have different outcomes. But at our place, we're after improved learning outcomes, self-regulation, and how order. That's our educative purpose at our school. And we believe that when we work together, we've got a better chance of doing that. If I pick relationship in particular, relationship in primary education is so critical. It's the foundational thing that's going on there. And yet, if I happen to be a teacher that sounds or behaves like a child's uncle who's actually abusive and unkind, I've just got a, a really diminished chance of building a positive relationship with that child. Every time we add someone else to the space and we believe that relationship is so important, we're increasing the possibility that there's going to be a connection there so the child has a better chance of learning. Feel free to challenge me if you think I'm talking bollocks.
flexible spaces. Have a look at what sh your people, as they go into our spaces, should be able to have within a classroom other than what we're doing right now. Those things. Now, despite the rumours about noise and about children getting lost and all those other things, if you consider the spaces that we've got that are 470 square metres and the possibilities to create zones for learning based on different learning styles and needs and times, we can continually reconceptualise and remodel that space to create these. Teachers are challenged to do that in a 66 square metre box on their own. Another good reason is because um, you know the decade of the brain, as Nathan McCarty Wallace calls it, that period where you could actually see what was going on in the head while people were alive, has taught us quite a bit more about how children learn and the things they need. And in our space, we talk about movement, laughter, <coughs> music, and relationship, four key factors to developing a, a quality learning environment. And again, those things are more possible in the flexible spaces that we've got than they were in the traditional box. It's not impossible, and I have to be really careful about this and, and really upfront. We need to be quite respectful to the people who have worked in traditional classrooms for the last 30 years, and a lot of places throughout New Zealand will continue to. They've done a good job, the best job they can, and they've been affirmed in that space. It's pretty wrong of us to say, you've been doing it all wrong. The only right way to do it is to do it in a flexible learning space with other people. So we have to be talking about and, not either either. Because based on rumour, and for me it implies it's not true, when people are coming back with stories of going into what is perceived as a modern learning environment, so, so I'm thinking about your language mm -hmm. that you're using as well. Um, I'll come to it, but really I suppose what it comes down to is the, the it. So what we end up talking about is a space. So people are saying, in that space, in the it, there are children that are lost. Have you ever seen that in a classroom? So um, the, the challenge, I suppose rumour might be the wrong word, it's the, um, the misuse of information. It's saying because they're in this space, there are children that are lost. There are children that are lost because it's not a quality teaching and learning environment. And in fact, um, to respond to that, um, I was interviewing Jackson about three months back, and I said, what do you love about this, Jackson? He said, I love, well, I said, what do you like? He told me, I said, what do you dislike? And he said, I dislike that I can't get away with anything. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, in the classroom I had one set of eyes, and now I've got three teachers and a learning assistant, they can see me all the time. So I suppose it's the stories that are coming out and being publicised and being sort of said, you know, well, this is the experience for everyone, is, is my concern. So hang on, with that in mind then, I've seen uh, in the paper in the weekend, um, Mate Dave Hodges at Rangitoto taking kids coming up from where Murray Abrams hands is mm. at Hobsonville mm. with parents hauling them out. So what's happening there? Why are those parents hauling them out if this wall this is so wonderful? I don't know the context of what's going on in both schools, but I, parental expectation, parental understanding. Would you suggest that perhaps it's because parents are seeing a school that they are not familiar well, with? I was going to say, the whose perception is it? The kids or the parents? Yeah. The parents come in and get a snapshot and they're not really, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. I, I'm just, in, yeah, I mean, I'm just pushing it out there. I'm not. I suppose one of the examples we had is at um, Maitakere when we went from traditional classrooms. At Windsor School it possibly wouldn't have been a big shift because we already had spaces. Burwood School didn't, they had classrooms. Despite that, when we went to Waitaka and we took a library and said, actually this is a wonderful flexible learning space, let's turn it into one. We moved the library out and we brought three classes in and we sat down with our parents and had a few sessions talking about what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're going to do it. And there were some concerns at the outset. What mitigated all the concerns and why just about all the um, concerns stopped is because of the feedback from the students. So the students went home saying they were enjoying school, they were learning lots, and they were enjoying the opportunity to learn with different teachers who had different skills and attributes. So I suppose in the context of, um, to be fair at Hobsonville, they are pushing the envelope to some degree around NCEA, yeah. 
that will scare people who see exams as the final outcome of school. So there's a few other things they're doing. But I would suggest that if the parents were listening to their children, and those children are being enabled as self-regulated learners, they might have a different outcome. Mm. I, you know, this is me with a secondary lens mm. um, and with that particular interest, because I, I've heard what many of my secondary colleagues in Christchurch have said about kids who are coming from these schools, and um, it's entertaining. I think, I think your point... Sorry, I don't know your name. Nikki. Nikki's point is interesting because I was just talking with a fellow principal today who's setting up a brand new school. That school is designed to be um, capacity 750. It's going to have on opening day about 50. The community are worried about 750. My Takati school already has 700 children. It had 800 last year. They don't really care because the relationship has been developed. There's a culture that exists. So I suppose in a lot of ways in these new environments, people are looking at, at um, some big headlines and are looking at things that they're reacting to because they don't have a culture and a relationship, I think is possibly part of the problem. Yeah. Your response to question before links to a wondering about got around um, children who are learning English as an additional language. And I hear over and over again from SL teachers in the Kempo area that in the modern learning environment these children are lost. And my wonder is, are they any more lost than they were in the, in the traditional style of classroom? And I don't know. What do you think? I've got a slide way down there, but we'll talk about it now, is in the example of the special needs child. So that's another thing you would have heard. Special needs children, this is just not a good environment for them. It's just an illogical statement for this reason. If I'm teaching in this space with 30 of you and one of you happens to be a highly special needs child with a whole lot of support needed, we are in this box. There is no escape for you as a learner, there's no escape for me as a teacher. I have to deal with you. In our spaces we've got four teachers, we've got breakout learners, we've got multiple zones. I just can't for the life of me see how it's more logical to believe that a child will cope worse in that environment where there's choice about relationships, about space, about zones, than in a box where I've got no escape. So that's the special needs children. I can't see any different for the ESOL children, because if we come back to what I'll show you shortly about building our foundation right, about quality teaching and learning focused environment, those issues might be short term system things that teachers will have to tweak, because it is a different space, but ultimately that should make no difference if it's a quality teaching and learning environment. Are you aware of And I, I, think I'm, I think for a university it's going to be an interesting challenge because how do you do the research yeah. on 75 children in this space and three lots of 75 here unless you clone the teachers and the children, which is why I haven't dug into it because it is a so minefield. A significant body of research on effective Correct. And for diverse learners. And if you actually unpack those things, the best group are the schools that are diverse learners. That one well marries up with some of the philosophies that underpin, you know, well, I think you just did first of all think about the pedagogy and not the actual environment. Yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, certain people were so fixed on this MLB but not actually the practices that are fueling the need for physical changes. And part of that has been some poor communication from the Ministry, from principals associations and from educators themselves and I might just jump forward to that because I think that's quite relevant um, I can keep on giving you reasons why this should work and people I'm sure will give us plenty of reasons why they can't and all those reasons why they can and they can't actually if we just talk about quality teaching and learning and what teachers can do together I can find no logic why me working on my own in a single space that has no flexibility no opportunity for any other way of being could be better but as we could learn from the open plan era, maybe we just need to go into it. that comment there about yeah. buildings and space. It's, it's just not true. The space we have, I won't say it on camera, it's stunning. Um, there is some quality research around um, PCTs, the retention of PCTs, PRTs, in the states who were um, going into co-teaching environments was far more, um, they were retained longer.
that'll be because of the collaborations. Yeah, and think of this, and this is what I find fascinating about the job you do. You spend three years training up teachers in a highly collaborative environment. They go into a classroom and they've got the teacher next to them, they're working to them, and then they come into our school and we say, ha, thanks very much, Kitpai, there's your room, close the door, we'll see you once a week. It is a nuts system. And the teachers who have come into our space this year, who one missed out on being in the collaborative space, just the nature of our transition, she was gutted. And the other ones have said that it has been professional learning on steroids for them. They're just learning the whole time. And the support is there for them the whole time. It just, it doesn't make sense that our current system of putting a student teacher in a box and leaving them for four days a week is beneficial for them. Because basically they're left to their own devices. And despite the best work you do, they will default to what they had when they were taught at school yep. under pressure. Absolutely. So I suppose that's a good place to look and to start considering. Um, here's another, here's a, a really important reason for me before I jump out of these, about visibility and deprivatisation of space. So we close that door and I've just run a professional learning session with you people and Des, you pop through there and your class is going and you close the door and say thanks Neil and then you're back into what you do and you go into default mode because of the pressure on your own and it's very likely that what we spend our time talking about goes out the window. But when you two go through together, you look at each other and say, oh, that's right, we're going to try that thing, we're going to give it a go, we're going to talk about it. It changes the whole dynamics that go on in space. So our bang for our buck in terms of what we're investing in our teachers goes right up. Um, I suppose the easiest way to explain it is that Des is that child in my class that drives me nuts. Oh, no, I'm not supposed to say that, but he does. When, I, when I'm alone with Des in my class, I have to find ways of coping and working so I can get by through the day, because although I've got Des, I've got the rest of you to teach. One of the comments is from teachers is that when there's two of us, I can literally say to Julie, So not only has my relationship with him changed because I don't have to cope on my own, I have someone else who can support me, and now it means that I can focus on some other relationships in the room, which is much more challenging when I'm there on my own, trying to figure it out on my own. My own. So that's one of the, the reasons behind that, that re relationships are enabled. And it's also the understanding that I don't click with every child in the room. Mm. I want them to think I like them. You know, they should think that, shouldn't they? But I don't click with all of them. Um, and remembering my reporting from students is far more anecdotal yeah. and what the students tend to say is in a space I was able to go and learn with so and so and so I asked them said, we've got three homeroom teachers so my question was do you like to learn with your homeroom teacher so that would have been the teacher they had in the past and the answer was actually I really enjoy going and learning with so and so relational stuff so that would be a two way street You know, there's, there's all these different things that can go on. But that, that statement there is quite global. And so that's why I'm not well, unhappy about sure. that impact of relationships with all the kids, or does it just simply push the balance up that the kids that you might have had such a great relationship with are a bit more on an even keel because it's much more of a dispersed relationship rather than just with one single teacher. Do you see what I'm trying to get at here? Because that relationship thing is something that I'm very interested in, sort of There's an important other component to that. So in a flexible learning space, in, in our environment, and in Canterbury in particular, we think relationship is critically important for our children in that space. So first of all, what I'm reporting back is what teachers said to me back through the survey. So I haven't gone back and dug into detail to respond to your question. Um, but there is, there is a challenge for us that if we're in a flexible learning spaces and these are my three teachers, is there a risk that my relationship will be watered down? 
and, and in a post-earthquake environment, is that a good thing for the children? So part of the work that we need to think about is how do we make sure that each child has a go-to person, and if that doesn't work for them, then I've got some other options. Yeah, and that's really important because there is a whole continuum of how collaborative learning spaces are evolving. The longer people are in the spaces, the less likely they are to have a home room teacher. So if I go to Silverton School in Australia 20 years into this, they don't have home rooms anymore. They don't see it as a need because of the culture and the existence in there. I don't know if maybe they'll come back to it. So it's an interesting phenomenon that um, because of the way that teachers, often it appears to be more about teacher insecurity than students. But it is a really important question and we need to keep on looking closely at it. Oh, and you probably would have heard this plenty. Um, one of the most exhausting things for teachers in the space is they just talk non-stop about learning. And in fact, I think a challenge for us, we're talking about a culture is, will they all stay in their learning studio instead of coming down to morning tea and lunch to meet with other people and develop relationships? You know, and that, that is a concern, especially in a new school where we're trying to create, create a whole school culture. Um, I'm going to skip forward. So, Here's stuff that is anecdotal feedback to me. Remembering this isn't my research for my thesis. It's just the work that I've heard when I've interviewed children, children in our space. Oh, sorry, the top one is from the open plan era. So in the open plan era, the report was children had an improved attitude to school and to learning. And their sense of well-being was improved. Also in that era, um, one of the reportings was that teachers felt they were more able to stretch the more able children. Now if you think about what typically happens in a classroom, not a New Zealand classroom, but some classrooms in the world, teachers pitch at the middle. And the more able children, they say, well, I'm sure they'll be fine, we'll give them something to do in a way they'll go and they'll go with it. That's actually not good enough. And in a collaborative environment, we can, through either learning coaching or using our teaching in different ways, really challenge those learners. So both ends of the spectrum, from the open plan era, the reporting from teachers that they felt better able to cater to children's needs. Okay. Here's an interesting one. So if I'm looking at some downsides of these spaces, we have to be really upfront. If you as a teacher want to control the space and the children, you probably would be better off not being in that space. Because as soon as you open it up, you have less control. The more you control me, the less I control myself. So the New Zealand curriculum is encouraging us to develop lifelong learners with self-regulated. So the challenge for us is if you go into the space and you believe in a teacher-centric model, and so we've heard some of our high schools in Auckland say, yes, we believe in it, we're going to keep on doing it, that's good. Might be good for them. I don't know it's necessarily good for the New Zealand. I can't see it being an outworking of our curriculum. But if that's the way you're going to work, it's going to be a problem because my way of controlling the class is this, yours is this, theirs is this. Actually, it should be about enabling our children. And in Australia, we first went to nine schools before we narrowed it down to three to take the rest of our staff back to. Sorry, four. Five of the schools, within a couple of minutes of walking inside we knew there were four teachers teaching four classrooms that they were trying to control in an open space. Bad idea stick with the other approach if that's what you're going to do because you really don't understand the why, the how and the what. That's when you'll hear the reports of noise. That's when you'll hear the reports of disruption. That was reported in the open plan era. Don't go into these spaces unless you know why and how and you've got a good understanding of how to implement teaching in those spaces. Of this type of learning. Yep. Um, I think part of it, I'm just wondering how your experience has been, especially with moving to schools, in terms of the collaboration of teachers. So I've just noticed that sometimes if the teachers cannot collaborate or work well together, I can see potential issues come about. So, one of the essays to collaborate that does come out of research, my research is skills. And I'm talking about the skills of collaboration. So, let's just forget children for a moment. We're not supposed to, but let's forget them for a moment. That section is about what are the skills that we learn, and this is really important for you people, what are the skills that we learn so that we can collaborate effectively? That's, that's, yep. I've seen it not working. It's often been because those skills are not there, and the teachers are just not able to collaborate well enough together. Or I've seen an example where one teacher was just so 
I just want to be in control and I want my single cell classroom back. I don't want a part of this. And so there's just, just really difficult to work because it's which is why it's fascinating if we talk about effective pedagogy and what the New Zealand curriculum encourages us to do it's all in there to say that it would work in these spaces the challenge we have is is that being lived and breathed in our schools already and one of the questions I have and I think it's in here further on does your school or does a school understand what effective or quality teaching looks like and feels like in your school and is that reflective of the New Zealand curriculum if they don't, and you put you two together, and you think it's this and you think it's that, we've got a problem. Yep. And in um, the early stages, the implementation dip, you know, you got that unconsciously, sorry, unconsciously inept, and then you become consciously inept, and then you become consciously, what's, yep, and then unconsciously. In the first stages, and what's really interesting is that people are highly relational at the first stages of this. So your relationship matters almost more than the job you're doing. Which is the children, yeah? And that, yeah. So at that stage, and this is again from the open plan era, and we should take notice of this, is that's when you need some professional learning. How are you two going to work together? Because it's not called RTC anymore. P, no, the first criteria, it's about you working collaboratively. You have to do it. So how do I help you to do it? Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why the open plan thing failed, because teachers, there were, um, it was the education board who appointed young teachers to mm -hmm. schools, teachers to schools in those days, and then I was part of the rally ad. I walked this talk with four, three other teachers and a hundred kids in a school where it was a punishment to send the kids home at three o'clock. Just so one a, they loved school so much. Mm -hmm. But after I only left to go overseas, but the problem that happened after that was there were teachers being placed there against their will. They did not have the interpersonal skills to teach in a school like that. Now we were still, we were collaborating. The yeah. collaboration was there. Yep. Two men and two women in year five and six, 100 kids, many of whom were um, disengaged from schooling. They're the ones that came from Spring and Lynn Hay to Rally Air to open it up. But, um, and we were working till six every night when most teachers went home in those days, about four or half past four. And it was the best teacher. When I talk to students now, and I talk in about six other schools as well, I talk talk about my experiences at Rowley Air. What you said that's where I learned how to teach. Yes. And I'd been teaching at Oakland year seven and eight before I moved to Rowley Avenue. I thought I knew how to teach, forty five year eights I had. But thirty five years ago at Rowley Air it was the experience I always talked to students yes. about. What you said is really important though, um, through the open plan era Initially, the people who were in these spaces, because this again wasn't a directive from the education department, it started in Finmore School in 1959 in the UK, it came from the sector. The early adopters were people who wanted to be there, but then the system took over. Let's be, let's be warned about this though, let's look what's happening in Christchurch. This wasn't a ministry initiative. Take Freeville School and Clarkville School and these other schools have been doing it for quite some time. Early adopters, but what happens in another two years, when we're up to 30% of the schools in Canterbury that are like this, in another five years we're up to 50%, because those people who are going into the spaces didn't opt to be there and didn't necessarily buy into it. So what are we doing to support them to transition so that they can have the relationship? Because you know what, your job, I don't care how we word this, you're being paid to cause learning to occur. You're not being paid to get on. That is a big challenge for our teachers as they go into the space, because they think, I really don't want to work with that teacher. Yep. I imagine a police officer saying that. Look, I really can't go out in the car and rescue some of the moment because I really don't like this guy here. They're paid to serve and protect and we're paid to cause learning to occur. Yeah, but you share those wonderful moments with children. I've never loved teaching as much as I did in that. And that's, and that's what I mean. People don't want to go back, do they? I, I say to people now, it was the same except for the technology, but your, what you've done this afternoon has actually made me realise it wasn't just the technology that was missing. It's actually the... Um, Children are self-regulated learners, and we taught in a very traditional way, if you like, yeah. just with small groups on the mat. But of course, there were two things missing, which I'll talk about, you know, in the future. One was technology, and one was a, a new view of the learner. Yeah. And yep. those are the and different pedagogy, and those are the ones. I'm going to jump forward because of that. Um, one of the the challenges of the open plan era, the curriculum, and the understanding about children's learning was here. The space was here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's now here. Yeah. 
there isn't the huge shift. All those wonderful, wonderful theorists and educationists, Piaget, Vygotsky, Montessori, those people who led to that progressive education movement, their stuff is filtered all through the New Zealand curriculum. So now what we've got, we don't have this huge divide that says we can't do this thing because it doesn't work. It's actually screaming out for us to work in a way that children can work in that environment. Yeah, you're going to have a massive disconnect, and this is what I've talked to with secondary principals, because you've got kids who come from that mm -hmm. smack bang up against your, your traditional um, uh, you know, te technicist approach in, in most of our secondary schools. And for part of that reason, they believe still is the nature of NCEA. Yep. And it's been a challenge for us at Windsor School. Many, many years ago, we started to do some research on homework. And I'm sure you know, it's yeah. nonsense. Yeah. That'll be used yes. polite language, yep. The research is really clear. There's only two things that improve learning outcomes through homework. Mm -hmm. Did I say that right? Through homework. One is basic facts, some basic retention of number, and the second is reading. Mm -hmm. Nothing else makes a difference. So at Windsor School and Clarkville School, many years ago, we dropped it. And we created a whole new option of things that children could opt to do, which was about cooking and doing things with family and wonderful stuff, because you know your parents are great first teachers. Keep that going. Do a bit of reading at home, do some basic facts. Kate the pie, that's actually what you need, we don't need to do all this other nonsense and project sheets and all that. One of the comments was, well, what's going to happen when they get to high school? I don't my response is, well, well, actually, you're quite right. But my response is, my response is, it is not my job as a secondary school principle to teach using poor practice and poor research and poor methodology to prepare children for something they might get at high school. Yeah. My job is to make sure that this is what the research informs us, that this is what we will do, and you know what, there's a better likelihood they go off to high school and be able to manage their homework because we have a home learning option that they could opt into because we wanted to meet self-regulated learners. Same thing applies in this context. Yes, it could be problematic when they have to go and sit down, but I would hope you could almost get a little revolution driven by students rather than teachers saying, I don't want to be in this environment. And our high schools are aware of the fact that for some reason, apparently, when children are four, and four and three quarters in a preschool, and they're all sorted, and they know how to work in their preschool, they become five, and apparently, they know nothing. And they have to be taught exactly how to do everything. But apparently, by the time they get to year six, they're all sorted, and they go into intermediate and they know nothing and they have to be taught how to do everything. But wonderfully, by the time they get to the end of year eight, they are stunning leaders and fantastic, but in year nine, they know nothing. And they have to be treated as if they have no self-regulation, no ability. Now you talk to high schools about that and they'll say, yeah, that is true. And is that okay for our kids? And I think our kids might be the ones who are saying, I'm not wanting to continue to do this. And why are you telling me where to sit when I actually know that I can make some wise choices? And why don't I get to know what's going on with my learning? That's my hope, would be. Yeah, you're disillusioned though, unfortunately. You're right, but There's we're... There's so much enthusiasm when it comes to secondary school. Mm. I used to think it was all secondary school and then I realised that because um, one of my beliefs was what happens with secondary school is they suddenly get turned off learning and then I did some research into it and I realised we were actually doing it within the first year of school. We were teaching children to sit down, fold their arms, sit up straight and listen to the teacher and not talk and be good. Be good. Is that what we wanted for our learners? So we've, we've still got a lot to learn. I think that's what we're starting to see through these the affordance of these spaces, but more about what we're doing as teachers and educators, rather than what a building does for us. Actually, the link between the early childhood and primary is one of the key things. Isn't it wonderful? Because what you're talking about really is what's going on in the early childhood. Yep. Right now. Um, most of our new entrant parents aren't particularly concerned. They say, oh yeah, that's pretty much what, like, what's going on. Um, except that they still, most of us live in that land of, um, what's it called? Um, the land I used to live in, um, that place where I live in my past. So most parents expect school to be like what it was for them. And I just can't remember the right word for that at the moment. Um, so there is a challenge when we confront them and say it's not going to be like that. Mm. And it shouldn't be because we're not in 1950 and you're probably not driving the same car and using the same phone and living in the same sort of house and we're not going to have the same sort of school. Correct. Parents. Mm. Um, I'm an early childhood, not primary, and I think some of our early childhood teachers kind of need to, to articulate 
why things are done in early childhood centres that are different than are done at primary school. And so I think that's part of the challenge is actually teachers being able to articulate to parents why things are different or how things could be or should be for their children. And I take responsibility as that for that as a leader. So one of the S8 is about support for teachers. So what am I doing? to enable my teachers to be able to have those conversations and um, be the professionals that it says they are on that little certificate. So we've got some work to do there. So we've got, um, it comes back to that pre-service, or use the open plan era pre-service and in-service professional learning. What are we doing in advance to understand where we're going and once we're in there, what are we doing to help enable us through that? And what are the leaders doing to have the backs of the teachers when the parents want to complain about it? Or are we just saying, you guys give it a go and we'll see how it goes and leave them to it? Unacceptable. It's not not a position that schools should be in. Thank you. Um, and that sort of comes to that third one. They feel unsupported for the paradigm shift um, because they're just being told to do it. They're not sure why. They're not sure how. But give it a go, and it should be all right. I don't. We didn't do that with numeracy. I don't think, did we? Oh, the but did we just say to them, "There's a new project. Go for it." We did. Maybe that was part of the problem then. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it is scary to think, and I suppose that's why I feel so passionate about this research. It's scary to think I'm seeing a repeat of some poor practice and poor structures and poor systems when we don't. This doesn't need to be a disaster. Just wondering about um, principals being exposed to their community. You talked about um, not leaving your teachers exposed to that community, and, the, and, and in terms of principals, you know, talk to some, and some of the concerns are that they are expected to to sell or communicate this with their community and it's like a cold start with their community and it's repeated around Canterbury, it seems to be a huge burden. I suppose that's why the, when I did a presentation last week and twice last week there's so many there because they're wanting to know what. And I don't, I don't suppose everyone has the time to go and do the research, um, but yeah, it is a risk. Um, and that, that's why I think we need to have a, um, a multi-sector multi approach. So. Th the organisation, the ministry, the, we should all be, CPPA, we should be working together to support our leaders, whose job it is to support their teachers, to make sure that the children are in the best learning environment. It's a fair challenge. Yeah, with the transition, um, I heard um, Cheryl Doig speak about the new school that's being developed out at um, Aranui, with Chisnawood and Avondale, etc. Have you had any um, input in there? Or any yeah, just don't let them hear say Chisnoy because they wouldn't know that. They're not in it. <laughs> yeah, it's um, I don't know, and all the primaries. Um, um, I've met with the principal, and that's as far as it goes. Cheryl was talking about them all being there together, designing their space, and talking about teachers, secondary included, only having for resources a small box like this. One of the things when we went out to, with the normal school conference, we went out to Pegasus and we've been out as a staff as well. Um, the principal there, talk, Roger, talking about teachers not having anywhere to put their resources, so that was sort of there are some things that, that again come out of the open plan area, I'm going to keep harping back to it because it's good stuff. Teacher workrooms, necessary. Breakout learning areas, necessary. Connection to the outdoors, necessary critical was the breakout learning areas. So in our space we do have we have teacher workrooms but they're also going to be a space where people can take children to learn so it's got a multiple use but it does have a secure storage place for my resources. But to be fair, to be fair, the school is not a dumping ground or a storage place for my 30 years worth of resources that I've collected. So part of the process is to say maybe you take two truckloads home and we'll keep one covered load here. But I do agree, we think it's important in our place that teachers do have a space where they feel like my stuff is there, I've got a space separate from my learning environment. So part of that is to work with concentration spaces to be asked to teach the teachers and teachers and teachers and Um, they thread those sort of things through. So one was that they do want to work space and 
So that's been listened to by the architects. And so I think it depends what's actually probably voiced. Yeah, and there is a risk in that, that if Des is a principal, I'm going to use you Des because I know you know him better. Des is the principal, but he doesn't know that that's possibly something we should have. So the downside is that... The consultation is crucial. Yes, and probably... Um, principals and others being able to visit other spaces and hear from other people so they can see what's needed and what not. Yeah. And, and that's why we did Australia. Um, you know, three iterations and every iteration, when I say iteration, first learning studio 150 children had bang, bang, bang and bang. Second one had changed. They got rid of one of those big tiered seating fixed arrangements. The third one had changed again. So we were able to learn from then seven years of practicing in the space and building the next one that was slightly better. Why wouldn't we go there? And the media and their nonsense at um, Littleton, it really wasn't communicated well, was it? Okay, let's skip forward. It's a question time. We got to the first section. <laughs> so that, that first bit was going to take 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's three minutes to go? No. Well, we've had discussion. We just said to... Okay, I'm going to kill some, quickly kill some rumours though and sort out some stuff. MLEs. See these things here? This, this is the, the rationale for an MLE. So MLE up to 2012, the 2013 they were called MLEs and that's what you needed? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's the architectural requirements for the open plan schools. Yeah. Right. Just to be clear, all of those things. So in other words, the MLE name is a bit of a nonsense, isn't it? You can hardly call it an MLE if that was around 1970. So that's a good reason the MLE's got, yeah? yeah. Um, ILEs and ILSs. What a wonderfully rich document about teaching and learning. It would be like calling our spaces the New Zealand curriculum. That's how misinformed it is. It is a powerful document about how to work together and create an environment. And I'll give you an example. In the ILE, there are these seven principles must be present for it to be an ILE. And here's my question for you. Do you need a flexible learning space for all of those seven principles to be present? No. So how do we call a building an ILE? A building is simply a building with fittings and furniture and that's your physical space, whether it's a flexible learning space or a traditional classroom. So let's just call it that. Let's not call it these other names because we're really confusing ourselves and everyone else and our parents and the whole wide world. Let's be clear that you've got two options. A flexible learning space for a classroom. We know what Auckland Grammar is going to go for because yep. they believe in teacher centric. You beauty, there you go. That's what they'll get. Whereas someone else will get flexible learning spaces. The environment is created by the interactions that occur within that space. The humans and their pedagogy and the things that go on. I suppose one of my challenges for you as um, educators of future teachers is do you have clarity around the language and can you help them to clarify it a wee bit? And I don't think it's particularly hard. I just go for it. The buildings are called flexible learning spaces and the environment is what we create within it. Yeah? And um, <laughs> the last question, are you, are you engaging in quality debate or emotive rumours? I'll use that rumours word again, sorry. Um, but I am challenging you as, as leaders of our our future teachers, um, how much of the stuff that's out there that gets continued and it grows, you know, so the special needs children needs aren't being met, and the ESOL children needs aren't being met, and the noisy and the this and that. I think there's a real opportunity there for you to listen um, and to be informed, but actually to press forward about quality teaching and learning. I think that emotion might be that sort of Yeah. Classrooms that's teacher led, not child centred. When we've had some very successful teachers who have taught. Correct. And still do. So, yeah. And the emotive language about the single classroom is the word single cell. Oh, so that's so totally you know, unacceptable. You know, it's not a prison. They were designed by the same people, but that's where it comes from. The architects of the early schools were prison architects. So, um, okay, and we've covered this one. Isn't it all about relationship? Yes and no. It's all about the learning. And you have to work the relationship to cause the learning to occur. But that's RTC number one. That's what I'm going to ask you to do professionally. I will support you through it. But you're going to have to work with that person. And the honest truth is you'll get on with about 90% of your fellow staff members, but there are 10% that you might end up killing. And as a leader, my job is to make sure that maybe I don't put those 10%ers together. Why not? Because it's not in the best interest of the children.
Yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, not particularly new when you think about some of the stuff we're talking about. I don't want anyone else to see me teaching. Hmm, why not? Yeah. Well, it's the most, teaching is the second most private thing adults engage in. Didn't you know that? <laughs> We're not going to do the other. Draw your own conclusions, mate. <laughs> Are you clear on the difference between co-teaching and team teaching? Are you clear on? Uh, do you know? Shall I just quickly cover it? I quickly have co-teaching inclusive schooling movement from the US. It was where we had a classroom. So I've got my classroom. Then it's mainstream in New Zealand, but the difference is in the US you had um, specialist teachers in the, main, in the schools that were the separate schools before, whereas in New Zealand we just had general educators. So when the schools closed down, the inclusive schooling movement, those children went into the general schools. They had to have the specialist teachers going into the room with them. They were the co-teachers. So it changed the ratio in the class. It wasn't a big class with multiple teachers. It was one class with generally a teacher and a paraprofessional. And what they realised is, instead of Des working with the special needs boy here and me continuing to teach the whole class, perhaps, perhaps Des and I could work together differently in that space to benefit not only, what is your name? Stuart. Not only Stuart, but everyone in the class. So that's what co-teaching is, and when you look at research about co-teaching, that's what you're looking at. So when people say co-teaching doesn't work, they're not talking about what we're doing in New Zealand. However, you've all got a smartphone? On your smartphone, can you just put up your hand if all you use your smartphone for is to make phone calls? That's there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, so you win that one. <laughs> That's why they're called <laughs> smartphones, eh? <laughs> so if all you did with your smartphone was answer and make phone calls, that would be stupid. Because the device is far more powerful and enabling than that. So if you just used it like a telephone, I'd be saying, <laughs> not very smart. In the context that we're working in, what comes from co-teaching is there are some strategies, some apps we should be downloading into our teacher skill set so that when we work in those spaces, we might work in different ways for the benefit of the children. We would be stupid not to. So co-teach in a different environment, but there's still some things we can take from that. Bits from here, bits from there. One teach, one assist, observe. I mean, your students do that all the time, don't they? They get observed. Why wouldn't I do it when I'm working in the space and, and have someone watching what I'm doing for five minutes of my lesson and say to me afterwards this or that, or how about if they're watching a student while I'm teaching my lesson? Use those, the power of two, and then you've made a difference about working in the space together. And I'm not gonna go through all of these, you can find these yourself quite easily, just Google them. And we've refined them at our space down to five. But these are powerful teaching strategies. They are not new pedagogies. They're just strategies you employ as collaborative teachers. Can we get a copy of your PowerPoint? Sure. Yeah, I'll cut all the bits I've left out. Team teaching comes from the US middle school movement. It was, I think it was Alexander was the father of the middle school movement, 1963. And he did what you can see at Burnside High. Big school, and we wanted to be careful that our children didn't go from primary, remember the middle school movement is before they went on to senior school. So they wanted to create a bridge, they wanted the children to feel that they had a relationship. So they made schools within schools. But they never taught in the same space. It was just that we're the team that looks after 150 teach, uh, children, science, maths, English, social sciences, and the children just stay in this space with us instead of going around all the staff in the school. So the only teaming they did was what we call in New Zealand as team meetings and <laughs> syndicate meetings. So the research again about that is not particularly helpful. So if you look up team teaching doesn't make a difference, well, it's not talking about what we're doing in New Zealand. So what we're doing in New Zealand is a hybrid. Oh, and team teaching number two is the open plan era, as you know, where people were dropped in the space. That's the closest comparison we've got to what's happening now. But the biggest problem was the lack of understanding, the lack of professional learning, the lack of strategies, the lack of support, the lack, 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 lack. So they can both make a difference, but we're not doing either of them, and that's what we are doing. And it could be two, three, four, or five teachers. So some of the new schools that have been built, um, um, uh, 150 children's space. So six, seven, eight children, so teachers. Just, just 
picking up just just the puzzle for me then, and, and granted, um, Neil, because I'm um, program coordinator for the graduate and secondary. Mm -hmm. um, that that on the one hand, and this is looking at a political level, because we we've, we've had a success a succession, and this is and help me out here, people who did the grad the dipping man with me. The you know the various. Tomorrow schools thing in '89, and then when the National Party came in that level, I guess what I'm thinking of in the back of my head is compliance, 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 and that that view of of um, the industrial technicist model of measuring things like national standards, all those sort of things. Mm -hmm. And puzzle, my puzzle, to use that term, is again, how does that mesh from a political perspective when you've got a ministry which is Perhaps a, you know, from a general public perception, I'm thinking of from a politician's perspective, that that it is going to be far harder to have a level of compliance, if you like, in something which is so much more flexible. Except that one of the challenges I have for staff in these environments is, if that you believe, yeah, it does. If you believe that in this learning environment you can improve the learning outcomes, the whole order, and the well-being of our children through the type of environment you create. That'll show up in the measures we have. It doesn't need to be about the measure, it needs to be about the environment we create. And I suggest that's what Hobbs and Bull Point and Albany Senior High School and those places are aiming for as well. We actually think that by doing this, not only are our children going to get the self-regulation and the motivation and the enjoyment, they're also going to get the tests as well. And easier in, in primary, but um, still, that's where I believe we have to go. I mean, I, I do know that in one of our local independent schools, there's a science department who are actually having a flat, far more flexible attitude towards the whole way they're teaching science with a very, their, their inquiry model is heavily informed by what's within the curriculum and they are, instead of teaching directly to the this, you know, related achievement standards, they are getting a very strong project base or an inquiry in science and the, the, the assessment to it. Which the irony of that is that inquiry learning predominantly comes from the science sector. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so, so these, these, this are the sectors that said this is how you're going to get children to, and, and young adults to learn quality stuff, yeah. not by standing up in front of them and, and saying stuff. Is that, that's what Matt Nichols pushing? Yeah. yeah. Um, so what I've created to help schools to figure out where they're at with this and teachers is to figure out where are we on this continuum. Yeah. When we're talking about a collaborative, up the top, the collaborative teaching continuum in a flexible learning space, where are we and where do we want to be? So part of it I talked about, you know, I don't know why and I don't know how and I don't know what. So here's some of the, the what's. The, what's the outcome we want in the space? And this, this isn't good or bad, it just is. And can you identify where you're at the moment? And now that you can see some possibility, do you want to head further down the track? And I think that'll continue to grow and evolve as we understand more about the power of children being able to learn in these spaces. And maybe just about the quality effect, I'll back up from that, about quality teaching and learning. Um, I've covered that, so I've got why, how and what. Yep. Um, there is no question about it, this is hard work working in these spaces. To start with, to start with, the longer people are in them, the smarter they work. For example, in our space, we've got one space and four teachers and only one lot of walls. So I now don't have to spend every afternoon trying to make the walls look stunning and put up art displays because there's four of us doing it. We don't have four times the wall space. It's just simple stuff like that. We plan together. We assess together. We actually possibly improve our time management skills because after school we take a quick walk, I hope, around the paddock to get the brain going and we get in and we work for an hour and a half and then maybe we go home and switch off. So a goal could be that through this we work smarter and teachers actually have a bit better of work-life balance. Um, the fact people, some people just don't want to be seen teaching, you know, because I don't want people to know how I teach and the fact that I just give out worksheets. One of the biggest challenges is there's no, um, a lack of awareness, so EQ is possibly more critically, well no it's not more, but it's critically important in the space. So if I've got no self-awareness about how I come across and then we're going to work together, <laughs> that may be a problem. So we do work at our space and you can use Herman Brain Models or the Balbum Teamwork Profile, help me understand what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses, what are my allowable weaknesses and my non-allowable ones, the ones that I need to be challenged on. And that's part of the skill set we need to develop around collaboration for our, for our teachers. And it's also, I think, in part of teacher training, um, our young student teachers need to know their skills, their weaknesses and what they bring to the place. So when they sit there on the interview and I ask them, what do you bring? A smile? Maybe give me a bit more understanding a bit more about self. 
And this last one here is critically important if these places aren't going to implode. And it's the same in your workplace. So Julie and I should be able to have a private conversation about the work we're doing or about my thesis without me thinking Julie's going to run around to every one of you. <laughs> His thesis is rubbish. Can't believe it. He's just not listening. Private honesty, public unity. And these spaces are so important because it's about trust. Um, you know what? The spaces don't necessarily improve the learning outcomes. It's just what people do. And you know how John Hattie says stuff and everyone thinks he's against things? Look at that. I think he just read some of the research I had. Because then he said that, and I think it's so valid. And this is why I went to see um, Peter Hughes, because I see a repeat of that. We were just saying, you should be fine. We'll put the space there and away you go. And, and actually that was in the Department of Education um, record from the Minister of Education in the UK. He basically said, um, if we build those spaces and put the teachers in, they should be fine. They'll pick up the philosophy. <laughs> just off the walls. I've talked about negative examples. Um, Michael Absalon of Value and Associates, his matrices are wonderful for talking about learning focused environments instead of teacher controlled or activity focused. So here's one of the challenges, must do's and can do's. We're all going to do must do's and can do's because they're a hallmark of these spaces, are they? Is it quality teaching and learning? We're all going to do negotiated timetables because they're a hallmark of these spaces. Is that going to enhance quality teaching and learning? It may do, but we should ask the right questions. So here's what comes out of what people are saying about how they're going to survive in these spaces. Um, New Zealanders aren't particularly good at this. I've noticed in Vancouver they deal with conflict a bit better than us. They're quite up front about it, yep. aren't Americans they? Are right up front yeah, it. man, in your face. I walked into one of the schools and the principal said, Oh, Neil, you'd like to hear from Steve. He's having some real problems working in this space. And still, Steve, talk to Neil about your concerns and your misgivings. <laughs> um, conflict is a reality of the, in these spaces and it generally leads to the next one and teachers are saying to me, oh yeah we're doing it, it's all fine and everything's sweet, I'm thinking either you haven't compromised or someone else hasn't because you can't work with another person without that happening. Usually the wheels come off at some point which means we need to come back to the skills and the private honesty and public unity. Okay, I'm going to do a quick um, test for you. So what do you reckon is the ideal team size in this? So all you have to do is you've got the choices of one, two, three, four or five or you may make up another choice. So your hand goes up for which you think is the ideal team size. So Sorry, not one. So two. Uh, for the number of teachers working in this space. Yeah. So should it be two, should it be three, should it be four, should it be five or more? So who thinks two? Who thinks three? Who thinks four? And who thinks five? And who thinks more? And who thinks different? And what's different? Yeah. 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 So it's it's the the, the thing is, uh, you know, let's here's another little bit of stuff that gets chucked in. The power of three. Thank you, Stephen Heppel, for just <laughs> messing that up for us. That's nonsense. Two's companies, three's crowd. I could debunk that in a second. Um, it is about the relationships and the the professional focus in the space. And they all work. It's just about the power of more than one. Mm -hmm. and, and in my research, people gave me reasons for each of those and how it worked in their space. For, and it, for, for one or two or three or four or five. Yep. Yeah. And it actually was about what they knew. It was about this stage and the development of all this. Yeah. Um, it's about the power of more than one. It's about working with someone else to achieve what we want to achieve, which is improve learning outcomes, self-regulation and how order. MLPs, or oh, I'll just do this quickly. Let's get rid of that nonsense term that is confusing the sector again these are not modern learning pedagogies because we've already got effective pedagogies. But this actually came through in my research. Here were some responses. Oh, well, we're, we're doing MLP now. Oh, I must find out what that is. So on the VLN, I don't think I put it up here. Oh, yes, I went into the VLN and I said, let's have a conversation about this. What's MLP? And people actually couldn't explain it. And that's because, and to be fair to Derek, Derek understands what he means by modern learning practice and has challenges to get people to think of different ways of doing it. But it's just gone all over the place now that really we could talk about effective pedagogy because it's in our curriculum document and use that as our basis rather than creating new things which adds to the confusion in the sector. So, 
this is, for me, sums up what we should be focusing on. <coughs> we should be looking, sorry, that is red down the bottom, it says effective pedagogy. That's the base of our pyramid. Learning is student focused, I've separated them because I don't think people understand them together. Teacher collaboration already happens in most New Zealand schools, that's not new to us. To be fair, internationally it doesn't, which is why when you get the um, NZDI president coming back and saying she went to this conference of collaboration and how important it is, I'm thinking, is that new to us in New Zealand? I don't know that it's certainly not in primary schools. Um, be clear, overseas it's not new to people. That I'm isolated in my space and I do my stuff and I go home. And, and in a lot of states in Vancouver, uh, sorry, in Canada, the law and the unions protect my right to do that. Yeah. I don't have to meet with anyone else at any time. Here's the challenge. This is what we've seen in the last few years. Put some technology into a classroom. Chuck some iPads in, that'll make it all better. Or put some holes in walls. That's going to make it all better. Or do collaborative teaching, that'll make it all better. And what it lends up is, is chaos for our kids and our parents and our teachers and our communities and mixed messages because we need to be starting at the building block of effective pedagogy and going from there. Uh, I've talked about that. And effect, so another thing we should be asking in our schools, and I do have this question for you as, as teacher educators. Do your people leave this space with some idea about what effective pedagogy is and isn't, about quality teaching and learning? You'd hope so, eh? They lose it within a couple of years. <laughs> we must muddy it up in schools. But I think each school should have a clear understanding of what it is, because if we don't and we start to work together in a space and we have three different understandings on it, we're setting ourselves up for problems. So I've asked you that question. I'll leave you this. Well, I've got time for this, the open plan stuff. Okay. Oh, no, I just gave it away. Have a read of that and see what you think about that for a rationale. I thought emerging technologies was particularly important in this day and age until that's where I, that rationale comes from. Yeah. It's not a bad thing. It simply means they were way ahead of their time, too far ahead of their time, yeah. idealistic in what they wanted to do and not having the support to do it. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to go through it, but there's yeah. those great influences, and Dewey yeah. would be one of the most important so ones, I think, there. So um, I consider Open Plan Area to be the manifestation of the progressive schooling movement. Mm. Pretty stunning people involved in that era. Um, oh, and the colour's terrible, all those are red. That's what teachers had to consider if they were transitioning, as you talked about, from a traditional classroom to an open plan classroom. Mm -hmm. So informal furniture, flexible space, self-regulated learners, deprivatised, team teaching, technology, students in the integrated day, uh, constructivist curriculum, and no curriculum. <coughs> the, these spaces, there was supposed to be no curriculum. Set up the activities, this is the ideal, set them up, activities, the children would come in and interact with those, and as a coach you'd come along saying, oh, that's interesting, and go right through the day doing that, and they would learn some stuff through doing, through experiential learning. So you set up meaningful activities, I'm not meaning to put those down in any way. That is a phenomenal amount to pick up and change and do. And lovely book I found in Wellington, the report on open plan era in New Zealand primary schools, 1977. One book in New Zealand, and it tells us a lot of wonderful stuff that we should use in this day and age. We've talked about these things, and I think it basically we ended up in a perfect storm in the late um, 1970s and early 1980s, and politics and politicians really put the end to it, saying we need accountability, we need standards, yeah. and we need measures. So who felt comfortable in that space when that was going on? And so Finmore School, 1959, that's what it looked like. Now if I could get an architect to redraw that for me with fancy stuff, what would that look like? A pretty cool space, eh? And that lasted through to 2004 before, because of a lack of understanding, it became that and back to what I know, back to default. And I've talked about the, the lessons, so we don't need to go through those. And I've talked about that. Um, the difference here, and in 2015, I think this is really important, so the, if we have effective pedagogy going on in our school already, we've got that in the school, yeah? The only things that teachers would then need to consider are those things there. Because they'd already understand the rest and it's not a massive shift for them. 
No. But that possibly is a big if. Mm. I think that should just about do it. Oh, no, there's my last message, last slide. <coughs> Not that. Not yeah. that. <laughs> I just wonder if people would like a few questions before um, we finish off. Or will we say what you think we see? Do you? Okay. Well done. Jelly. Hmm? <laughs> my job is to be thanking you, and I've really enjoyed you. it because. Um, and I know, I think it's absolutely fantastic, first of all, because we've got early childhood, primary and secondary, and they've all come at a very busy time, so yeah. they're obviously seeing to be a huge focus, and we're sort of working in a much more um, combined way ourselves. So, yeah. But um, a number of us, I know, are from the open plan teaching era, including yeah. myself, and um, enjoy that teaching, but I think the key thing that you're saying is about effective pedagogies, it's not really about the space, it's being really fantastic effective teachers and, yeah. and having that philosophy and not just chucking two or three people together and saying go for it. Yeah. So um, we have um, had two or three conversations in this e area and we're continuing to think about it and trying to think how we're going to incorporate it into our qualifications and our delivery and ensuring that our student teachers when they go out to schools are well prepared. Mm. I was surprised you only said 30% of schools. So that I would have thought from going out to schools and my visiting that it would be something like about 70 or 80%. Yeah. Do people feel yeah. like that? Oh, yeah. that are doing it, sorry? Yeah, yes. that's huge. Yeah, that's um, yeah, so I was talking about the number of new spaces. Oh, so okay. so our, school, our school is going through what, what we call, so I used to call them roles, holes, and so retrofit, old learning space, holes and walls, and my old learning space, a mole, and then a new space. Um, most people are working in the um, roles, retrofit, old learning environment, um, and they are doing a wonderful job given the constraints of those. Um, in a few years, so my staff, to be fair, are going to transition from those next year into that totally open space, and it's going to be another big transition, so exciting times, isn't it? So thank you, Neil. And Pleasure. we also have two of our VTech Learn students who have won positions there and will be starting next year. So that's some um, wonderful news as well. So that's thank great. you, everyone. Brilliant.